Well, hello everybody. This is Mike Prevost from MikePrevost.com. Uh, pardon the extra noise in the background. I'm recording in my camper van today. I'm camping on the beach in Southern California. Life is good. So today I want to talk about dietary protein and muscle hypertrophy. We're going to review the latest science. I'm going to cover basically a review article that uh, just came out on dietary protein and muscle hypertrophy. It's an excellent review article and we've got a lot to talk about. So let's get started. Well, most of what I'm going to talk about today comes from the review article you see here. It was published in the journal Nutrients in 1 January 2018 from a group out of McMaster University in Canada. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, go over to my website at MikePrevost.com and I'll have a hyperlink to the original article. So let's start our discussion with a review of protein utilization from ingestion to metabolism to incorporation of protein. And in this notional example, we're assuming that a person ingested 20 grams of protein with a meal. Now, once that protein is ingested, the first shot at that protein is going to be the digestive system. In fact, the enterocytes of the small intestine are going to take up a lot of that protein and use it directly for energy. The enterocytes take up a lot of the uh, nutrients that you consume. They're very metabolically active. The liver is also very metabolically active, and it's going to get first pass before the proteins hit the circulation. So between the enterocytes of the small intestine and the liver, about 50% of that protein that you ingest is going to be taken uh, and used before it even reaches circulation. And so of that 20 grams, we're going to end up with about 10 grams reaching circulation. Now that 10 grams reaches circulation, amino acid levels increase in the bloodstream and the body tissues now can start to utilize the protein. But the majority of it, about eight of that 10 grams, is going to be used by body tissues for something other than muscle protein synthesis. For example, it's going to be used for energy. Um, once the amino group is taken off, that carbon skeleton can be shuttled into energy pathways and used for energy. It's going to be used to produce urea and uh, to synthesize substances like neurotransmitters. There are a lot of neurotransmitters and, and also enzymes that are produced from proteins. And so that leaves a small amount of that original 20 gram bolus, about two grams which can be used for muscle protein synthesis. Now this looks like a problem because we're only using a small amount, but we really only need a small amount for muscle protein synthesis. Well, years ago, we used to believe that exercise stimulated muscle protein synthesis and then proteins provided the building blocks of muscle protein synthesis. But uh, more recent data has shown that protein itself can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So basically, uh, even in the absence of exercise, a bolus of protein can stimulate some muscle protein synthesis. And this effect depends primarily on the essential amino acids and especially the branch chain amino acids and of the branch chain amino acids, especially leucine. So once we achieve what's called uh, hyperamino acidemia, or basically dumping a lot of amino acids into the bloodstream, um, muscle protein synthesis peaks at somewhere between one to two hours. <clears throat> okay, so about one to two hours after we get a lot of amino acids in the bloodstream, we see a peak in muscle protein synthesis. But then it reverts to baseline. You know, it declines and reverts to baseline after two to three hours. Now, you know, this is this peak that happens one to two hours after hyperamino acidemia is not one to two hours after a meal it takes some time after you eat to get the amino acids into the bloodstream. You know, how much time? Well, it depends. So for a quick acting protein like a whey protein, it could be 30 minutes. But if you've got a mixed meal, you know, with some carbohydrates and fiber and fat, including something like steak, which is a little harder to break down, it could be three, maybe four hours. So it just depends. So the data shows that you know, plasma protein can stimulate muscle protein synthesis. That's good. Muscle protein synthesis means we're building muscle. How much protein is necessary in order to stimulate muscle protein synthesis? And this is showing um, maximum protein synthesis response, the amount of protein that's been shown to maximize that protein synthesis response in, in, uh, in one bolus, you know. And so here it is. You can see in young males, it's about 0.24 grams per kilogram, 0.24 grams of protein per kilogram. In older adults, it's almost twice as much, 0.4. So 
I mean, that's a little hard to uh, to figure out in your brain, but if you if you break out the calculator, you'll see for a 170 pound person that means about 19 grams for a young male, but for an older adult about 30 grams. So stop and think about this for a minute. This is pretty important. So to maximize that protein synthesis response in young males takes only about 20 grams of protein. You know, it's not really a lot of protein, and then we see that peak one to two hours later. But in older adults, it takes about 30 grams or so of protein to maximize that protein synthesis response. I've also calculated it for a bigger individual here, 24 to 40 grams. If you see, it's not a whole heck of a lot of protein. So in the last slide, we were discussing the muscle protein synthesis response to a single meal bolus. But we're not really interested in a single meal bolus. We eat multiple meals per day. And so researchers were interested in, you know, what's the optimum dosing regimen for protein to sustain muscle protein synthesis at a high level all day long. And so they tested three different uh, dosing regimens. And the first dosing regimen, they simply had individuals consume 20 grams of protein every three hours. That's it for a total of 80 grams of protein. And you'll see all three regimens, there's a total daily dose of 80 grams of protein. And they measure protein synthesis throughout the day. The next regimen they tested was 10 grams of protein every hour and a half, again for a total of 80 grams of protein. And the final regimen was 40 grams of protein every six hours, again for 80 grams of protein total. And so which turned out to be you know, the dosing regimen that produced the highest sustained level of muscle protein synthesis. Well, it was this one. It was 20 grams every three hours. And if you re recall our previous slide, that should make sense, you know, because in young males, 20 grams was the dose that was necessary to maximize that protein synthesis response. And remember, it reverts back to baseline after two to three hours. And so we would expect this dosing regimen to keep muscle protein synthesis elevated for a longer period of time. So why is the every three hour regimen, you know, better? Why does it keep muscle protein synthesis elevated to a higher level throughout the day? It's really simple. So if we think about, you know, plotting those lines, you can see that, you know, from our previous data, 20 grams was enough to maximize muscle protein synthesis, right? And remember, it peaked about, you know, two, about one to two hours after, uh, after the entrance of amino acids into the plasma. So it peaked at about one to two hours. And then after two to three hours, it started to drop again. So really, you know, if we're consuming 20 grams every three hours, we're able to keep muscle protein synthesis at near max throughout throughout the day. You know, in contrast, 10 grams is not enough to stimulate maximum muscle protein synthesis. So we get a little bit of a bump, but it never really gets quite as high as we would get with 20 grams. And, you know, for the last group, really, 40 grams of protein is plenty enough to maximize that muscle protein synthesis response, but after a couple hours, two to three hours, we're back down to baseline again. And so we spend, you know, the rest of the day in baseline and then we only bump it up again after six hours. And so, you know, I think it makes sense based on the data. It's, it's pretty intuitive that this is the way to go. Okay, if we're trying to maximize muscle protein synthesis is 20 grams every three hours. If you're an older individual, though, like me, you need to consider closer to 30 grams. Okay, so what have we established? We've established that in, in young males, 20 grams of protein is enough to maximize the muscle protein synthesis response in a single bolus. More than that doesn't really contribute much more. And we've also established that uh, getting that bolus every three hours keeps muscle protein synthesis you know, elevated throughout the day. So, you know, if you're awake for 15 hours, that comes to about 100 grams of protein total. So the question is, is that optimal then? So based on our data so far, you could make an argument that that's pretty close to optimal. But we'll have a little bit more to say about this in a minute. Well, we're gonna, what we're going to discuss next should make sense intuitively. Um, and that's that exercise sensitizes the muscle to protein availability. It sensitizes the muscle to protein availability. And uh, this is just some notional data from, you know, a series of studies that have shown basically that there's a 30% increase in muscle protein synthesis uh, 
response to protein after exercise. So what am I talking about? So if uh, we give somebody a bolus of 30 grams of protein and we measure the muscle protein synthesis response with no exercise, we, you know, we see a level about right there. Now, if we do the same, we give them 30 grams of protein after exercise, though, the muscle protein synthesis response is much higher. So it's about a 30% increase. So that increases the muscle protein synthesis uh, response to protein. However, I would propose that we're not really interested in muscle protein synthesis. You know, we're interested in protein accrual or building up proteins, accumulating proteins. And protein accrual, accrual is a result of a balance. It's a balance between synthesis and uh, degradation or proteolysis. Okay, so um, if we build more than we break down, then we accrue proteins. If we break down more than we build, then we don't accrue proteins. We actually lose proteins. So there's some proteolysis or protein breakdown going on all the time. Um, there's a constant basal level of proteolysis going on. It's, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower. And that's countered by protein synthesis. And so um, that's led researchers to ask the question, you know, well, we've you know, we've discussed and we've found ways, we've researched ways to increase muscle protein synthesis. You know, a bolus of protein does it, exercise does it. What about reducing proteolysis or the breakdown? Because if we reduce the breakdown, we also get protein accrual. Okay, so you get protein accrual by either increasing synthesis or decreasing breakdown. So let's talk about that a little bit. So the graph here is typical of the data looking at inhibiting proteolysis and maximizing muscle protein synthesis. And what's consistently found is that somewhere around 20 to 30 grams of protein it will maximize muscle protein synthesis, okay, in a single bolus. However, if you want to inhibit proteolysis, proteolysis or muscle protein breakdown, it requires over twice that much. Now we're talking about 70 grams or so of protein in a bolus to inhibit muscle protein breakdown. So, you know, that, that begs the question then, you know, we, we, uh, we gave an, what we said was maybe close to an optimum regimen earlier of 20 grams of protein every three hours, but if it takes 70 grams to inhibit muscle protein breakdown, well then should we be consuming 70 grams of protein every three hours? And well, this is where things are gonna get a little bit interesting, I think. So in an attempt to answer this question a little bit, scientists compared two different protein dosing regimens. They compared a 40 gram dosing regimen to a 70 gram dosing regimen, and they measured muscle protein synthesis and protein accrual. And what they found was muscle protein synthesis was the same for a 40 gram uh, dose versus a 70 gram dose. And we should have suspected that because you know, we saw some data earlier that muscle protein synthesis is maximized at 20 grams for young adults and 30 grams for older adults. So more is not gonna really enhance muscle protein synthesis at all. But what they did find in the 70 gram group versus the 40 gram group was that the proteolysis was lower um, because muscle protein accrual was higher. And so remember that balance between you know, muscle building and muscle breakdown. What we saw was muscle building was the same in both groups, but in the 70 uh, gram uh, regimen, muscle protein breakdown or proteolysis was lower, so you accumulated more protein. Now it's important to point out this is in the short term, and we don't know what would happen in the long term, but these researchers have some compelling theories about that. So based on, on that data, you know, there's a couple of important questions. Is eating enough protein to maximize protein synthesis enough? Is that what we want to do? 30 grams or so per, uh, per meal, 20 to, 20 to 30 grams per meal. Or do we need to ingest enough protein to inhibit muscle protein breakdown, which in this case is about 70 grams per meal. If our goal is to optimize muscle hypertrophy, which one is ideal? So the data shows a different response in trained versus untrained muscle in terms of muscle protein synthesis and proteolysis or muscle protein breakdown. And basically it works like this. In untrained muscle, immediately post-exercise or in that period 
uh, right after exercise, there's a greater muscle protein synthesis than there is in trained muscle. But there's a lower long-term muscle protein synthesis response in untrained muscle than there is in trained muscle. And conversely, in trained muscle, there's a lower muscle protein synthesis response immediately after exercise, but there's a greater long-term response. So what are we talking about here? Well, you know, in untrained muscle, you would expect more damage immediately after exercise than you would in trained muscle. Does that make sense? And it turns out that muscle protein synthesis is matched to <clears throat> muscle protein breakdown or that damage basically. So since we have more damage immediately after exercise and untrained muscle, we get a greater uh, muscle protein synthesis response immediately post exercise. And it's lower in trained muscle because we have less damage. But trained muscle is more sensitized and more capable of responding over the long term than untrained muscle. So, you know think about that for a minute the muscle is matching the muscle protein synthesis response <clears throat> okay to the proteolysis response or the muscle breakdown response do we really want to inhibit this then do we want to in inhibit that muscle protein breakdown well here's basically the argument that the authors uh, use for the idea that maybe we don't want to inhibit muscle protein breakdown with a huge bolus of protein. It's a really simple argument. When damage is done, as we do in training, there's some damage to the muscle. Um, most commonly, something called Z-disc streaming. The uh, contractile proteins attach in the muscle at the Z-disc and it gets real disrupted and damaged. Okay, And, you know, if you're going to remodel a house that's damaged, the first thing you're going to do is demo. So you're going to you're going to demo and, and tear out all the damage before you go in and rebuild everything. That's demo. So demo is basically, you know, <clears throat> muscle protein breakdown, that uh, proteolysis. Right. Do we want to inhibit it? You know, um, in the case of renovation, we wouldn't want to skip demo. And the authors argue here that in the case of basically uh, you know, building muscle or repairing muscle after a workout, that maybe it's not a good idea to skip that demolition either, that demo. And so a really big bolus of protein, like 70 grams, may constantly suppress that demo and over the long term lead to, uh, well, we don't really know. <clears throat> so this is where the authors start to get into their theory a little bit about uh, you know, repression of demo and provide some indirect evidence that it's maybe not a good idea to repress or uh, inhibit that demolition phase. And, you know, the first line of evidence is from gene knockout studies, admittedly done with mice, but uh, a good model for human muscle. And when you knock out a gene called ATG7, which is part of that proteolysis system, in fact, it's part of a system called the ubiquitin proteolysis system or UPS system. Uh, it's a real common system to remove damaged proteins in the muscle cell. When you inhibit that proteolysis system, you get a 40% decrease in muscle cell size in mice. And so what they're showing here is that long term inhibiting proteolysis are, are basically stopping that demolition. You know, it, it results in a, a negative in terms of muscle size. Well, the other line of evidence is that lower expression of genes associated with proteolysis, that UPS system, is associated with sarcopenia, which is a loss of muscle mass in older adults and reduced muscle function in elderly females. And so here's a case where, you know, when, that, when those genes are repressed and we get less proteolysis, you get smaller, less functional muscles. So there's at least some indirect evidence here that... Um, that counterintuitively, you know, repressing proteolysis actually results in smaller, weaker muscles. So you can think of the cells of the body like muscle cells, for example, existing in sort of two different modes. You know, there's a, a rebuild mode, there's a building mode, and then there's a, a repair mode, okay? And in the building mode, we're... Uh, we're turning on muscle protein synthesis to build lots of proteins. But in the repair mode, we're not doing that. We're turning off muscle protein synthesis and we're doing some demo to get rid of damaged proteins. And uh, basically proteins are, are built and packaged 
in the endoplasmic reticulum, which is a picture of the uh, organ that you see here on the slide. And in the endoplasmic reticulum, proteins are folded, and they have to be folded in a very specific shape in order for them to function properly or be incorporated into the right part of the cell. And what can happen is if muscle protein synthesis is turned on for a long time, you always get some misfolded proteins. And, um, and that's why we need demo. So we switch to the demo mode and we clear up some of those misfolded proteins using the UPS system. The UPS system will degrade them and get rid of them. Misfolded proteins is very toxic to the cell, to all cell types. When we build up a lot of misfolded proteins, um, that triggers the cell to go into something called apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. So the cell basically will commit suicide if it has too many misfolded proteins. So it's important to clear the misfolded proteins. And so the theory that these authors uh, propose is that really, you know, we want to we want to maximize muscle protein synthesis, but at the same time, we don't want to inhibit the opposite or muscle protein breakdown or the demolition. We don't want to take in so much protein that we inhibit the demolition phase because we want to clear those misfolded proteins and we want to clean up damage done by exercise. So this is a pretty novel idea and uh, you know makes a lot of sense based on the physiology, the ways we know that cells behave and based on some of the indirect data that we have. The idea is that you know we could we should focus on maximizing muscle protein synthesis rather than suppressing proteolysis, which may be important for muscle health and remodeling. So everything we talked about up until this point was considering a person in caloric balance, a person that was consuming enough calories to maintain body weight, which is the state that most of us are in most of the time. Now, there's been a lot of research looking at calorie deficits, basically people on a calorie reduced diet in an attempt to lose weight. And there's a consistent finding that, that uh, we see on in calorie deficit diets. And that consistent finding is that generally somewhere around 25% of the weight loss comes from lean body tissue, primarily muscle mass. So when a person loses weight, say a person loses four pounds on a calorie deficit, you know, typically three pounds is going to be fat and one pound is going to be muscle. Now, in some cases, it's more than that. It could be 50-50. In some cases, it's less. But, you know, on average, about a quarter of the loss is going to be lean uh, tissue. And, well, obviously, that's not good. We want it to retain the lean tissue, especially the muscle mass. So what's causing this loss of muscle mass on a calorie deficit? Well, we actually have a lot of data looking at that specific issue. And here's some notional data. And uh, what's been shown is, you know, we know, we've already discussed this, that post-meal there's a stimulation of muscle protein synthesis, primarily due to protein, especially the amino acid leucine, right? So we eat a meal, amino acids hit the bloodstream, and that stimulates muscle protein synthesis. Well, take a look at this. If we're in caloric balance, we get a specific amount of muscle protein uh, synthesis. But if we're in a calorie deficit, that same meal produces a lower muscle protein synthesis response. So what the data has shown is when a person's in a calorie deficit, they have a reduced muscle protein synthesis response to the same amount of protein. So it's pretty clear that a calorie deficit increases protein requirements. And so let's look at a summary of some data looking at two different protein intake levels and muscle protein uh, synthesis, an attempt to maintain muscle protein synthesis. And then we're looking at 0.55 grams per pound and 0.73 grams per pound. And if you're wondering how much that is, I did the math for you here for 175 and 145 pound person for both intake levels to give you an idea of how many grams we're talking about per day, okay? So let's focus on the non-training person first because that's what we've been talking about uh, all, uh, so far, okay? And so what they found was in order to maintain muscle protein synthesis, 0.55 grams per pound was not adequate. It was not enough protein intake to maintain muscle protein synthesis in non-training individuals. But 0.73 grams per pound was, okay?
So we said that the muscle loss on a calorie deficit was due to reduced muscle protein synthesis. And it turns out that, you know, for non-trained individuals, you can maintain that muscle protein synthesis by increasing your protein intake. In this case, 0.73 grams per pound seemed to work out just fine. And you can see for a 175 pound you know, person, that would be 128 grams of protein for 145 pounds is 106 grams per pro of protein. You can do the math yourself and figure that out, okay? But here's something that was really interesting, okay? So <clears throat> they also looked at resistance trained individuals. And what they found was the level, the low level that was not adequate for non-training individuals was actually adequate for resistance trained individuals. That resistance trained individuals, 0.55 grams per pound was just fine. And that should make sense based on what we've discussed already. We said that exercise sensitizes the muscle to that increase in protein. And that's what's happening there, okay? And the 0.73 grams per pound was also adequate to maintain um, um, lean mass and a calorie deficit. All of this is a calorie deficit. But here's something really interesting. <laughs> so when they got to one gram per pound of body weight, even on a calorie deficit, not only did they preserve lean muscle mass, but they actually increased lean muscle mass. They were ab able to increase lean muscle mass on a calorie deficit, something that some people think is impossible, but it's not impossible. Now I'll tell you that was a very small increase in lean body mass, but it was an increase. You know, so um, so this is very interesting. So for resistance trained individuals, what we see is, um, you know, you're not going to lose as much muscle mass on a calorie deficit if you're resistance trained and your protein requirements are actually less than someone who's not resistance trained in terms of maintaining muscle mass. However, if you do increase your protein intake to one gram per pound of body weight, you got a shot at actually increasing muscle mass, even on a calorie deficit. But again, not, not by a large amount. So let's review some additional findings from the recent review article. One is that lean individuals need more protein to preserve muscle protein synthesis than obese individuals. And that's because obese individuals have much higher energy reserves, so they're not having to use as much protein for energy. So their requirements are lower. The greater the calorie deficit, the greater the protein requirement to preserve muscle protein synthesis. And again, if you're in a big calorie deficit, you're going to be using more protein for energy. And so your requirements are higher. And think about this one for a second. This is the opposite of what most people do or what most people think. Most people think when you're trying to bulk up and gain muscle and you're eating a lot of food that you need a lot of protein. And in fact, the opposite is true. When you have a caloric surplus, your protein needs go way down because your body's not using protein for energy as much because you have all this other energy available. But when you're in a caloric deficit, when you're dieting, that's when your protein needs go way up. That's when you need more protein. And we showed earlier some data that one gram per pound of body weight seems to take care of that need. And it's possible that you can even gain a small amount of muscle on a calorie deficit, especially if it's not a severe calorie deficit, by increasing your protein to that level, one gram per pound of body weight. Now, protein has a satiating effect during a caloric deficit. So satiating refers to satiety or feeling satisfied. So people that eat uh, higher protein tend to spontaneously eat fewer calories. Or the flip side of that is if you're trying to eat fewer calories, when you increase your protein intake, it allows you to be more satisfied at that lower calorie level. Well, what's also been shown is that whey protein resulted in uh, more satiety than casein, but only if protein intake was low. And so, you know, what we're talking about here is on a caloric deficit, increasing your protein intake. You know, if it's above 25% of calories, then what they're, what the data has shown is that the protein type doesn't really matter that much you know that it's pretty much washed out whey and casein and other protein types that once your protein intakes above 25 percent of calories that uh, it's it's not so important uh, the source of the protein at that point as long as it's a high quality protein so let's take a look at the author's recommendations based on this review of the science and we're going to start by discussing recommendations for people in calorie balance. So that's people that are not trying to lose weight. They're not in a calorie deficit. Okay. And so the basic recommendation is to consume 0.73 grams per pound of body weight of quality protein. 
Okay, and the example is 128 grams for a 175 pound person is enough. And that, that'll optimize muscle protein synthesis without inhibiting uh, muscle protein breakdown or proteolysis. Eat protein containing meals every three to five hours to uh, continue to maximize muscle protein synthesis. And consume some protein one to three hours prior to bedtime to prevent a reduction in muscle protein synthesis during sleep. And also remember, you know, if resistance training, your uh, protein needs are actually less and you can get by with 0.55 grams per pound in that case. And again, this is for people in a calorie balance. So let's focus on the author's recommendations for calorie restriction now in this case. In this case, it's someone who's reducing their calories in order to lose weight. So protein needs are greater, up to 1.4 grams per kilogram. Okay, so for example, that would be about 112 grams for a 175 pound person. That's much over the RDA or the recommended dietary allowance. Well, we already discussed this, but leaner individuals need more protein to maintain muscle mass. In that case, it could be up to 1.4 grams per pound for a really lean individual. And so that's even higher. Choose high quality proteins, high in essential amino acids, especially leucine, or, or really the branch chain amino acids. And if resistance training in a calorie deficit, you know, consider consuming a gram of protein per pound of body weight. It's because there's some data showing that you can actually accrue muscle mass at that level. Well, there you have it. That's the summary of the review article and really brings you up to date on the state of the research on protein and muscle hypertrophy. So if you head on over to my website, I'll have a link to the entire article so that you can uh, download the article. It's absolutely a keeper. You want to grab this article and uh, keep it in your archives. As always, if you have questions, head over to MikePrevost.com and submit a comment or hit the contact me button and send me an email and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Okay, thanks for listening.